All right. Uh, so this is lecture 10 of ECE 503. And so in today's lecture, what we're going to be looking at is the frequency domain characteristics of LTI systems. We'll look at how they respond to different sorts of inputs and outputs. We'll characterize uh, their behavior, especially when we deal with rational representations of these LTI systems. And, and, and explore how we, like, you know, sort of as a starting point before we go into lecture 11 about filter design, or at least our initial uh, foray into that. So um, we've seen this before in the past several lectures about this sort of representation where we have an input, x, uh, x of n, and uh, feed it into some sort of system, h of n, to get an output y of n, okay? So this could be anything, right? So this could be, let's say, some garbled up speech. Maybe there's lots of noise in it. Maybe there's sinusoidal tones in it, right? And what we want to do is H of N serves a purpose. H of N is designed to treat. Again, remember that French. Oh, I don't know why I'm bringing up French. Like, like traitement de signal, like the treatment of signals. So that H of N, what it's trying to do is take X of N and enhance it, or manipulate it, or transform it into Y for some purpose, right? And this could be, and this is a signal, like, you know, this, uh, some of the examples I mentioned are like, kind of like in the electrical engineering domain. But suppose you're a mechanical engineer. Ah, oh, mechanical. Or a civil engineer, and you have sensors, right, on buildings, on aircraft wings or something. And what happens is, oh, there's this annoying static. There's a, this annoying uh, noise or interference. I want to filter that out. That's what H of N is designed to do. Or in biomedical engineering, the exact same thing. Like, let's say you're looking for specific signals, but you want to exclude others. You would use H of N, you would design it, you have the control over it, in order to take X of N and produce Y for some purpose. So, um, let's say we, like, in this slide, what happens is we, we, we have this sort of very specific example where we feed a complex exponential into the system H of N, and what we're wondering is, we're going, to get a y, we're going to get an output y of n that's also a complex exponential. And the question is, what does h of n do? Like, how does it affect that complex sinusoid that's going inside, or that complex exponential? And the answer is, we, we go to convolution. So suppose we have x of n, and it's convolved with, remember, convolved, not convolute. Convolute means, like, ooh, that looks convoluted, right? Convolved with h of n. And so you get this convolution sum expression. And then what we notice is the following. Let's plug in into x of n minus k. We, in, in, uh, we replace that with some generic complex exponential. a, e to the, um, uh, where did I write it down? So let's say a, e, j omega, n. So we plug that in for x of n. In this case, it's not x of n, it's x n minus k. So we replace the n with n minus k. All right? Now, um, we have that, and let's do a little bit of ma mathematical manipulation. And why do we do that? Because what ends up happening is, we see, if we do the convolution sum, we split up, we have an e to the j omega n minus k. Let's split up that exponential into two exponentials. What we get is actually the Fourier transform of h of k. Okay, nice little, nice little trick, right? It's a parlor trick. Like, hey, look what happens if I have h of n and I convolve it with x of n, and I do a little bit of magic by replacing x of n with some sort of complex exponential. I actually get h of omega. Okay, and in particular, I get h of omega. I get an A, the amplitude, so I scale my input exponential, and I also modify its phase somehow with the E to the J omega N. Okay? So th that's kind of a nice, cute example, and so what this does is it kind of shows us, like, if you have the frequency response of your LTI system multiplied by your amplitude um, of, the in of the input signal, and then multiply that by the phase of that input signal, you get the output, right? But, you know, in real, real world, we don't deal with just complex exponentials, not a single one at least. So what we want to do is we want to generalize this. Let's look at 
a broader range of input signals. What's a generic case? Well, how can we use this as a tool in real world? And the answer is the following. So what happens is this h of n, first of all, uh, we have this guy. So he's complex valued. Um, and that omega, okay, we can actually replace him in one of two different ways. Um, sort of in a Cartesian coordinate type of system, right? We can have a real plus j, um, um, uh, so real and imaginary components. So you can almost visually treat this like an x and y, and you can actually plot this in, in sort of a Cartesian uh, coordinate system, or you can do something more polar, where you take the magnitude of h of omega, and that's kind of like your radius, and e to the j big theta, capital theta, that's what that funny look, looking O with an H in the middle, omega, it's a function of omega, that's our phase response of our filter, so we can represent it in a polar form or a Cartesian form, right? So we can choose one of the two, and on the side there I, I describe how you can relate one with the other. Now this is important because what happens is, what this tells me is that suppose H of n is real, it does not necessarily mean that its frequency response is real. There are some special conditions that this would apply, but in general, h of omega is complex. So we need to understand how, which ways we can represent this. This is going to come in very useful a little bit later, because when we try and plot the frequency response, when you plot the frequency response, how do you plot it? Can you plot complex numbers? Sure. Would they be intelligible? Probably not. It's just going to be this squiggle in 2D space, and it's like, what does this tell me? Most folks, when they plot frequency responses, such as h of omega, how do they plot it? They plot it in terms of magnitude and phase responses, right? So in order to 100% capture the frequency response of an h of omega, you must have both plots. This reminds me of my days as a TA many, many moons ago, many, many many moons. Um, when I was a TA for a digital signal processing lab, when I was a PhD student, and I remember, like, you know, the, the, the professor told us, uh, you know, uh, take off marks if uh, the students don't give a complete answer. <sighs> you know, and I guess I was not the best friends of the, um, the students because what happens is uh, when they do the lab reports and we reach the part about, like, you know, frequency responses and stuff, they say, oh, yeah, 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 here, here. Well, here's a frequency response of h of omega. And then I took off a mark or two, and then they come, and you know, like, you know, they come and they say, hey, but, 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 but why did you take off the mark and, and stuff? And I said, you only showed the magnitude response. You have to put the phase response, because otherwise you're only showing half the info. You have to show both phase and magnitude response. Most people say, well, why do we care about the phase? Well, phase actually does a lot of different things to your information, right? Like, um, in, so, like, in this part of the course, we're going to be dealing with, um, you know, uh, systems that have a very simple phase response, mostly linear phase, right? Um, as I'll explain a little bit later. But in order to 100% capture the frequency response of something like an h of omega, you must show both the phase information and the magnitude information, all right? We'll look at that a little bit in lecture 11, all right? So, why do we care about this h of omega? To avoid convolution, right? So look, let's say we have h of n, we have an input x of n. What's y of n? Well, we can convolve the two, yeah, right? Or, you know, being the sneaky engineers that we are, no scientists anywhere? No scientists? Okay, okay, good. No scientists, so we can make fun of them. So what happens is, or what you can do, if it's easy, Ah, x of n has a very simple free, uh, Fourier transform. Boom! x of omega. Oh, h of n has a very simple Fourier transform. Boom! I take the Fourier transform, now I have h of omega. <laughs> Multiply the two together because we know that in the frequency domain, convolution becomes a multiplication. And then we hope, we keep our fingers crossed, that um, the h of omega times the x of omega gives us a very simple y of omega. Inverse Fourier transform. Boom! We're the hero, and then we can go and watch with whatever TV show that you like watching, like Mindy Project or something, right? So this is very powerful stuff. What, what's really interesting is this little 
little equation down here. So we avoid the convolution altogether, and everything just becomes a nice product, right? So we have to be a little bit mathematically savvy in order to solve for y of omega, and ultimately, and hopefully, y of n. Okay? And so this is what I was talking about, right? If we know our Fourier transform pairs, and it's nothing too difficult, I, I would say I would choose Fourier transform any day. It sounds a little loopy, like, oh, I need to go into frequency domain to do a product in order to go back into the time domain. It sounds a little bit difficult, but if it saves time over doing a very complex, very long convolution sum, I'll do that. I'll do that any day. Or, like, you know, so as a result, we have that, we can do, we can pull that off. And then, what did I mention before about the magnitude response and the uh, phase response? Well, it's interesting. So, that, what is the magnitude and phase responses of that output y? It's going to be equal to the individual magnitude responses of h of omega times um, x of omega. And the phase responses, it's kind of interesting. They are actually additive. So whatever the phase response is of um, h of omega is summed to the phase response of x of omega to give you y of omega's phase response. And even more importantly, is this thing about the einstein winner kinchin theorem, EWK. Ooh, I love EWK. And so einstein winner uh, kinchin theorem is derived from taking the magnitude squared response of this entire expression. We're going to see this also later on in lecture 11, where what we observe is this idea of, like, so the square uh, squared magnitude response of the output signal um, frequency response of the output signal, y of omega, and the input signal, x of omega, magnitude squared, that turns out to be equal to the power spectral density of x of n, right, the input, and the power spectral density of y of n, which is the output, right? And what einstein wiener kinchin theorem said is that if you have the power spectral density of the input multiplied by the magnitude squared, of the frequency response of the system that you're passing that input system a signal into, it's going to be equal to the power spectral density of the output signal. This is actually really powerful stuff. More importantly, it not only applies to deterministic signals, what we're playing with in this course, but if you are in probability and stochastic processes, which is another course that I've taught, this also applies to those signals as well. So in a random world or in a deterministic world, this guy holds, and this guy's kink. Like, you know, if there's any one thing that you walk away from in this course, it would be something like this, especially in, like, probability. So what this tells me is, in a lot of cases, I would like to know what is the density of that energy at the output of a system when I have a specific density going in and I have a specific frequency response of a system. So as an example, Let's look at the case of an LTI system, and this guy looks familiar, right? Right? So half to the power of n unit step function. So we know that this has a very nice um, uh, Fourier transform pair, right? It's going to be 1 over 1 minus a half e to the minus j omega, right? And then we also know that the input signal is just a quarter. So he's going to have this guy. So the ans now what we want to know is what will be the output, right? The frequency response of the output. What's going to be y of omega? It's the product of those two guys, right? Better yet, what is the power spectral density? Or the, sorry, I always say power spectral density. Is it power or energy? Energy, I'm sorry. My bad. So the energy spectral density of the output signal. Well, first of all, what I do is I take... I, I use the expression, you know, instead of convolve, I multiply the frequency responses of the input signal and the, and the LTI system. And so I get this very interesting expression here. Then what I do is I take the magnitude squared of that output signal, and it gets a little messy, right? Law terms, don't want to deal with it. So what I instead do is I know that this guy is going to be equal to the magnitude squared of h of omega and the magnitude squared of x of omega. And I get this guy at the end of the day. 
So at the end of the day, I get the energy spectral density of the output to look like that. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm in a mood to actually working it out. I'm not sure about you guys, but I want to do some doodling. Doodle! OK. Oh, that's, that's really cool how PowerPoint knows. OK. So we know that x of n is equal to a quarter n u of n, right? And we know that it has a Fourier transform pair that's equal to right. We also know that h of n is equal to a half n u of n. And it has a Fourier transform pair that's equal to h of omega 1 over 1 minus a half e to the j omega. Right? Am I right? Yes. <laughs> OK, let, let's do a sanity check, just in case, because I don't claim to be right all the time. I forgot a minus. Bad me. OK, pardon me. Minus, minus. OK, everyone's happy. Yay! Because I just see like lots of frowns and complex looks. I'm like, OK. Yeah, so it's like a closed feedback loop. It's like, oh, OK, I'm doing something wrong. So what we want to do is, so we have that guy. So first of all, suppose I have y of n, x of n, convolved with h of n. And my answer to that is a big red x. I am definitely not going to go that way. Rather, OK, I want to be happy. So I'm going to do y of omega is equal to h of omega times x of omega. Oh, that makes me really happy. So what that does is, if I multiply these two guys together, I get 1 minus a quarter e to the minus j omega, and I get 1 minus a half e to the minus j omega. Okay? And then, in order to get syy of omega, so just to, just to give a little bit of notation, like, you know, to explain what this is. So usually when we, we talk about energy or power spectral densities, we usually signify them by the capital letter S. And this YY means that it's with itself because you can also have, um, you know, so you have these densities either with itself or it could also be a density with respect to another. So you have like XY, YX. So it's like a cross spectral density. So here, at least for this part of the lecture and stuff, we'll be focusing only on energy spectral densities of the signal with itself. We're not going to look at SXY or SYX and all that. It'll only be SYY and SY, uh, SXX. So that, folks, is going to be equal to, just according to um, you know, einstein wiener kinchin theorem, that's going to be equal to this guy, magnitude squared. And then, of course, SXX of omega and this guy, we know is equal to the magnitude squared, right? So if you work this out, so what is the magnitude squared? So th that might be a question that folks say, like, how, how, do you, how do you get that? Well, what you do, let's, let's add a little step here. The magnitude squared of anything, right, is going to be this guy and this guy's complex conjugate. Same thing here this guy and this guy's complex conjugate. So as a result, if you look at this, so what is x omega complex conjugate? It's whatever's complex in it, right? So now, now people should not be frowning, right? And so this guy here, the same deal. So if you work it out, what you're going to get is something that will uh, consist of, like, you know, we're, we're not going to work it out. But if you look at the final answer in the lecture slides, what you'll get essentially is some DC term and a cosine. And why do I know that? Because what happens is when I have something, like, you know, a, a D, like some sort of constant and something that's complex, and then multiply by that same constant, and the complex conjugate of that thing, when I multiply them together, what I'm going to have is something real, right? Anything that is magnitude or magnitude squared is going to result in a real output. 
So if you work it out, in this case, you're going to get something that will essentially translate to, once you use Euler's relation, into essentially a cosine. And that's real. So at the end of the day, that's where we got this answer from. All right? Now, this is the thing that I was telling you guys about at the beginning of this lecture. This frequency response of the LTI system, this is actually pretty important. So this, this is where we talked a little bit about this before, where we can represent, let's say, some sort of um, system, some t sort of LTI system um, in terms of um, um, blah, in terms of um, the roots of the numerator and denominator. We call these uh, rational, right? The rational representation of a frequency response. So it consists of essentially a, poly a, a series of polynomials, right? So the numerator is a, a sum of polynomials with different complex exponentials multiplied by some sort of BK, so these coefficients. And the denominator is also a polynomial consisting of complex coefficients and complex exponentials all summed together. Right? And so what we want to do, our objective, we saw a little bit about this several lectures ago with respect to partial fraction expansion. What we want to do, we're not going to go that far. This is going to be really messy. Ma imagine you have like hundreds of roots. Like I wouldn't want to do P, uh, PFE. And imagine I gave that as a quiz question, you guys would slash my tires on my car before I get out of the building tonight. It's like I come out and it's like I see four flats and those are snow tires, you know. But um, the other reason why I want to factor this, I want to find the roots of the numerator and the denominator, is this will give me some insight onto the behavior of the frequency response of this system. What's really important is the roots of the numerator, we heard this term before, is the zeros, right? So every time I have a root, what that means, a root, first order section, right, in the numerator is whenever I hit a root in the frequency response, boom. Zero, right? It zeroes out the numerator, and I get a zero as an output for the frequency response. The denominator, if I have a root, right, we call it a pole. And when we have a pole, and my frequency response at some point, let's say, equals that pole value, I get a zero in the denominator. That's actually not so good. We saw that before. Remember with the Z plane? When we had poles, we want to stay clear of them because that basically makes our Z-transform explode. Zeros, I don't care. That just zeroes out the Z-transform. This is the Fourier transform equivalent of those Z-transform Z plane. And in fact, we're going to look at that a little bit more right now. So first of all, like, you know, we do a little bit of magic. So um, notice that in this case, we don't have a problem by using ZK as the notation for zero, right? Before it was con completely confusing. We had zk times z to the minus one. Oh my god, which z are you trans uh, talking about? That z or that, that, that z? Is it with dry like, you know, imagine if I'm walking the hallway and several of you are working on the homework and I listen to that, I'll just, I'll just be totally confused, right? So here we don't have that issue. But uh, note, note something really powerful, and this is going to come up uh, very soon. Note that, that e to the j omega, right? That e to the j omega, that's where the z used to be, right? In the z transform plane, right? The z plane, I just replaced it here with e to the j omega. But more importantly, um, how do we map z in the z plane, in the z transform domain, to the discrete, Fourier trans discrete time Fourier transform domain? Z is equal to R e to the j omega. Everyone remembers that? Remember? What's interesting here? What is R equal to? 1. So what's really important here is that we're observing all of this from the perspective of a unit circle. Right? We talked about this before. The Z transform domain, we were playing with different radii and different angles. Right? Here, the Fourier transform, all we really care about is the perspective, right? 
around a unit circle. Like, so if we look at the Z plane and you draw a unit circle, the Fourier transform, all it cares about is everything surrounding that unit circle. And that's about it, right? On the other hand, the Z domain, you, ha you have this two-dimensional space because you actually have more than uh, just one degree of freedom. Instead of just going around the unit circle, you can play in any which way in that Z plane. And so actually, let's, let's actually go back to drawing. Oh, let's do some drawing. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I really like this. I, I should get one for home. So, um, so th OK, so let, let's, first of all, let's, let's look at se several simple truths. So we have the Z transform. And so what do we know? We know that, um, and we have also uh, the discrete time Fourier transform. And so they're related. Remember, z is equal to r e to the j omega. What we notice, okay, so th this is sort of the generic expression, generic. But if we try and actually make a DTFT out of that, what we need to do is, to make a DTFT expression, R equals 1. Therefore, view from unit circle okay, in Z plane. So let's go back to this guy here. So we have this H of omega business. And we have. Um, a series of roots, right? Um, blah. Just want to keep the notation. Sorry. Keep, 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 keep. Don't discard. <laughs> so, um, yes. Okay, so one's, yeah, let's do that. Mouse is very twitchy. So what we've got is we got one minus z k. And so let's say we have k. I'm not going to specify the, the range. And then e to the j omega. And then we have, and let's say there's also b naught. And then again, k 1 minus p k e to the j omega. And so what we end up having is we have all these zeros. We have all these poles. Okay? And we saw what happened. So uh, recall that, let's say if we look at the Z plane. So here's that unit circle. Okay? Unit circle. And so we saw what happened when we had poles and zeros, right? We might have a zero um, at the origin, we might have a zero over here. We might have conjugate zeros over here. Um, and then we also, s yes? Pi. Wh wh where? <sighs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So the question was, um, pi not sigma, or product not summation. You're, you're correct. Ah, sorry. Uh, I should want to erase, but um, I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you. That's a great catch. So it should be pi. So it's a product. Thank you. And then we saw this. Let's say there's some poles there. There's some poles there. And so what we're going to see, right, is that later on, and in, uh, what we're interested in is essentially that, that omega thing. So this omega term, this omega, okay, refers to some sort of azimuth that goes from 0 to 2 pi all the way around the z plane. Okay? So it's the azimuth at the origin okay, that, that swings around uh, z plane. So it's this guy. So that's omega. Uh, 
So, not only that, but what Fourier transform does is the following. So it's, this is not a polar or zero. This is actually the, my point of observation, right? And so let's say this is omega equals zero, and then I steadily have this little lo um, uh, lo uh, locus? I guess it's locus. This locus essentially traverse the entire unit circle, and it's kind of interesting. The way this works is the following. That locus, um, what it does is it takes into consideration, like, essentially what it does is I'm at all times measuring the distance of this locus to all poles and all zeros in the z-plane. So, and the reason for that is the following. So we can actually rewrite this entire expression. Each one of these sections actually represents there is a distance factor so th this guy here, each one of these terms, each one of these roots or factors, there's a distance and there's also a phase associated with them. What ends up happening is that distance is what we really care about. There's also the phase part, but we'll, we'll deal with that in the next lecture. But what ends up happening is that as I traverse this, this locus, this point of observation, and I get close to, in this case, to this pole, what happens? The closer I get, the distance gets smaller. That means one of the roots in my expression for h of omega is actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the closer I get, the smaller it gets. And what ends up happening? My denominator gets smaller, my h of omega gets bigger. On the other hand, let's say I keep on moving. Duk, 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 duk. And let's say this guy's relatively close. What happens if I get close to a zero and closer? My, num nu my numerator of my expression for h of omega actually gets smaller, and therefore h of omega gets smaller. So we're, again, we're going to see this a little bit more clearly in lecture 11. And I'm going to sort of show now the mathematics behind what I'm talking about. But that z-planes business that we talked about several lectures ago um, and the translation from the Z domain into the Fourier transform domain, it all really comes down to observing how close you are or how close you are on a point at a specific angle on the unit circle to every pole and every zero. And the closer you are to a pole, the, the bigger your response is because you're shrinking the de denominator. And the closer you are to a zero, the smaller the numerator and the smaller your overall frequency response. So if I look at this guy, and I, I, I now regret drawing a very complicated z-plane, but bear with me, what you end up getting, okay, so let's say that's, this is your h of omega, and let's say that's your omega, and that's, let's say, mm, plus pi, and that's minus pi. So as you traverse, what we see is the following. So let's say we have this. Oh, I'm getting really, so let's say this angle here is pi over 4. You'll see an increase in h of omega, and then it's going to decrease. And then as I traverse, I get kind of close to, to a 0, so I actually get lower. And then I get at basically pi or minus pi, whichever one you want to refer to, it actually gets really close again. And the same thing happens, ah, same thing happens at this end. So what, what, the four each, what the frequency response does is you take the Z transform space, you plot all the locations of the poles and zeros, and what, what, the, what those locations tell you is where you should emphasize the frequency response and where you de-emphasize the frequency response based on those zeros and poles roots, okay? We're going to see this again in lecture 11, but this is sort of a heads up, all right? And it's really powerful stuff. So instead of using MATLAB, so let's say next week I say, okay, folks, uh, your quiz for the next 20 minutes, draw the frequency response. Oh, I want to see Z planes and poles and zeros and stuff. Drawing, okay? <laughs> and you thought you gave away, uh, you know, drafting class long ago. No, no. Okay. So let's go back to lecture 10. So 
this is what I was talking about before, replacing each one of these roots, right, with essentially the equivalent of a magnitude response, V of k, if you're in the numerator, you're a zero, and U of k, if you're in the denominator. So that's the magnitude of every root, and then a phase, a, a, a respective phase, right? So uh, theta k and phi k. And so what you can do is essentially you can decompose if you have the magnitude of the frequency response h of omega, which is what I drew before, um, all it really comes down to is the product of all the different distances between all the poles and all the zeros in the numerator and the denominator. And what happens is it's usually the one pole or the one zero that's extremely small, like, you know, that distance. There's one that dominates, and when that dominates, that's where you see the unique characteristics of your frequency response from minus pi to pi, right? As I'm sweeping around the unit circle, that's what I'm drawing, okay? So that's my frequency response, the magnitude, frequency, uh, the magnitude of the frequency response. There's also the phase response, and that's all additive, right? So th that also, like, you know, if you extract the phases, and what you're going to see is, essentially, what do those phases represent? Um, is at the z zero in the pole um, is essentially the angle of separation between, let's say, the x-axis, like relative to that pole or that zero, and then how much it sweeps in order to have a vector drawn from that zero to where the locus, the point of observation is. So that turns out to actually be your phase at that omega, right? And then you sum all those tetas and all those phis to give you the phase response of your frequency response h of omega, right? It's not as intuitive. Like the other one was like, oh yeah, if I'm close to a pole, it's big. If I'm close to a zero, it's small. This one's a little bit more trickier. That's why people don't like playing with phase. It's like, what does that mean, phase, right? All right. Okay. The last, the last uh, slide for, um, for um, uh, this, this um, lecture. And again, this is actually really powerful stuff. So this is actually something that I've asked many times before in classes and quizzes in both uh, a probabilistic setting as well as a deterministic one. So, for, so this is the magic of using the frequency um, domain in order to extract information which would otherwise be really difficult to get. So suppose I want to, suppose I know what the autocorrelation of the input signal is, I know what the impulse response is of the LTI system, and I want to find out what the autocorrelation is of the output, right? So what's interesting, it's actually kind of interesting, and I wrote it here, so you might say autocorrelation? Like, what's, what's that? So the autocorrelation is this guy here, this expression. This is where we talk about, like, you know, probabilistic stuff, right? So the autocorrelation of the input, let's say uh, Rxx of m. So this is a discrete time autocorrelation, is essentially how correlated is the signal with itself at different sort of separation. Like, you know, so, so you take the same signal, you replicate it, and then you sort of sweep, like, you know, you, 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 you take the two copies, you multiply them together, and you see what the product is. Then you shift by one, one of the copies, do the exact same over again. You shift by one, you multiply together, you see what it produces. You shift by one, shift by one, shift by one, shift by one. And what this tells you is what, how similar is that waveform at different sort of delay or separation in time, right? So I might, like, you know, what I should expect is that when there's absolutely no difference, no delay between the two copies, I should have the maximum correlation. And you would be right. And then what happens if I shift it by one? Oh, they're still very highly correlated. Oh, very interesting. Make a note of it. Let's shift it by another one. Mm, the correlation's going down. Okay, noted. So what this tells me, this gives me a lot of insight as to the property of that input waveform. Sometimes I would love it. Like whenever you hear, like, let's say, that signal is uncorrelated. You might hear that. How many people have heard of uncorrelated? Uncorrelated, ah! Okay, okay, everyone else is like, oh. 
So what happens is when it's uncorrelated, when the two are not shifted with respect to each other, maximum correlation. Any other position that I multiply with, it's zero or close to zero. That's considered uncorrelated, right? The signal, uh, the signal basically, other than that one instant, when it's matched with exactly with itself, it has no correlation at any sort of delayed version of itself, right? What's interesting is this guy, the uh, autocorrelation of x and the autocorrelation of the output Kind of tricky to calculate, right? Again, it's like, oh, I've got to take the E. What's E? The expectation. It's an average. I'm supposed to take the expectation of a signal conjugate multiplied by the delayed version of itself. Oh, that's so yucky, right? So what do I do instead? What I do is, first of all, okay, I find the autocorrelation of the input. Maybe it's easy. Maybe it's tractable. I take the Fourier transform. What does the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation give you? energy spectral density. Oh, yes. Then I do my magic. I then, what I do is I say, okay, energy spectral density, yay. einstein wiener kinchin theorem, because I know what the system is, I know it's Fourier transform to get the frequency response, take the magnitude squared, multiply by the energy spectral density, I get the energy spectral, I get the uh, energy spectral density of the output, take the inverse Fourier transform, I get the autocorrelation of the output. Beautiful. I think every year that I've taught probability, so I, whenever I taught grad level probability, I always gave a problem like this. This stuff is golden because it's going to save you lots of heartburn trying to do everything in the time domain. So much more easier. All right? Okay. So, th so that, that's what happens when. Um, if you have a stochastic input and you have a stochastic output and you have the autocorrelation. Otherwise, if it's just like, here's the energy spectral density of the input, energy spectral density of the output, what's sort of the logic to get one to the other given several sets of knowns? This is how. All right? Okay. So with that, uh, that concludes uh, lecture 10. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a push. Mm -hmm.